Our next speaker is David Salman with um, David Salman and Associates. Um, he represents individuals and corporate clients in terms of business support. They set up new businesses, advise them on issues related to running their business. Um, he's worked for large uh, firms but prefers service available in a small firm giving clients direct access to the attorney. Um, one uh, little particular thing about David, he grew up in Las Vegas, um, graduated from UNLV in 1995, and he passed the uh, Nevada bar exam on the first attempt. And that's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> that makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So David's going to talk about business structuring and legal issues. David, that's far too much information for you to know. <laughs> you must have went to my website to get all that. I appreciate that. Um, wasn't that a wonderful presentation we just had? That's hard to follow. Great job. Um, the game is the subject of stepping safely into your new legal entity as a business owner. And I got that subject and I thought about, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so. Uh, the first thing I got was, okay, what does that mean? And then they, then I found out it's contracts. And that makes sense to me. So let me tell you a little bit about contracts and what I look for. I usually get people call me up and want to review a contract. That is the best thing to do. Now, I also know that many of you will sign a contract without ever having a lawyer look at it. That's just the nature of business. Lawyers are expensive and you are going to be tempted to look at, look at a contract on your own. If you do that, fine. But I'm going to tell you what I look for in a contract, okay? Um, so you probably want to take some notes because I'm going to tell you what to look for, all right, and why they're important. There are certain provisions that are in most contracts or in some contracts that can get snuck in that you're not aware of. And I want you to know what it is that you're looking for and the reason that you're looking for these in particular in the state of Nevada. Number one, I want you to write down choice of law provision. Choice of law provision is a provision that says what state's law applies to that contract. What law applies to the interpretation of the contract. Now here's the kicker. I represented a landlord who got a phone system and I looked at his contract and he had a choice of law provision for Kansas City. Now what did that mean? That means he had to go to Kansas City to defend a lawsuit. Okay? They forced him in that contract to fly to Kansas City and to appear in Kansas City. Now I was his attorney and he didn't want to pay for a Kansas attorney, so he took me along. And I told him, I can't represent you in Kansas. I'm not licensed in Kansas. But he wanted me to be there anyway. He was going to represent himself. So the two of us fly to Kansas City. And we're not actually in Kansas City. That's where the airport is. And we get in the rental car and we drive down these lonely roads until we come to a small little town. And as soon as I found that small little town, which was the headquarters of this national phone company, I turned to him and said, we are in big trouble. Because that phone company owned that town. It owned the judges, it owned everybody in that town worked for that phone company. All right? That's how important this choice of law provision is. So always look, what, to, what law applies to that, to that contract? because they're going to haul you into some other state to defend if you get sued. You do not want that. Okay, so be very much aware of the choice of law provision. All right, number two, attorney fee provision. Fees and costs for any litigation. Always look for that. In the state of Nevada, this is why this is so important. In the state of Nevada, you cannot get attorney fees unless there is a statute that allows for it, which means the law is passed by the legislature says you can get attorney fees in this situation. <coughs> which by the way is rare, or you have a contractual provision of applying for it, okay? If your contract says that you can get attorney fees in litigation, then you can get them. If it doesn't, you can't, except in some rare instances where the state legislature has specifically said, in this case, you can get your attorney fees. That is a huge thing, and we talk about it whenever I do a, a review, when somebody brings me a lawsuit, and I look at that contract, and I said, we can defend this if you want to, but you're going to pay me more than this case is worth, and you won't get your money back. You're not going to get your attorney fees. And it just kills them. It kills their defense. When they know that they're going to pay their attorney more than it's going to cost to defend it, and there's no chance of them getting their attorney fees back. All right? 
That's why an attorney fee provision in your contracts are so important, okay? <laughs> and make sure it's not one-sided. I've seen that before, where one side gets their attorney fees and the other side doesn't, okay? Next one, write this down, indemnity clause. That is, a, that is a strange word that a lot of people don't understand, but it can have dramatic impact on you. So let me tell you briefly, when it, oh, by the way, contracts is a full year class in law school, so you're getting the real you know, flyover. But let me tell you a little bit what indemnity means. <laughs> indemnity is like this. You're, most of you, if you have a brick and mortgage, will have a lease, unless you buy your building, you'll have a lease. And in that lease agreement, your landlord's gonna say, if I get sued for anything that happens on your property, you're not only going to pay what I have to pay, you're going to pay my attorney as well. So what happens when somebody slips and falls, let's say, at, at your profit in your business? They will sell you, they will sue you, and they will sue your landlord. And if your lease agreement says that there's an indemnity provision protecting the landlord, you will not only pay your attorney, you'll be paying his attorney. You'll not only pay what you have to pay to that person, you're going to pay what they have to pay to that person. So that's significant. So write that word down, indemnity. Look it up, know what it means, because it can have a real significant impact. Arbitration clause. Um, arbitration clauses, I used to think they were useful. Now I'd never recommend one unless you want to keep something private. Here's the reason why. Arbitration is supposed to be cheaper, it's supposed to be faster, and it's supposed to be private. Out of those three things, it might be private but it's not cheaper and it's not faster. Most of the time you'll get something that says the American Arbitration Association, and I'm getting recorded here, so I don't want to say too much about it, <laughs> except to say they are not less expensive and they are not faster. You're going to have to, you know, that's just my experience from doing this over 10 years, okay? So if you're going to get an arbitration provision, you have to understand this. The arbitrator will be paid by, <laughs> judges get paid by the taxpayers. So keep in mind that if you give up your litigation rights in the state courts, in, in your court, in order for an arbitration provision, you're going to be paying the arbitrator. And I will tell you this, this is something you need to know about arbitration provisions. If you sign a contract for a car and it has an arbitration provision in it, you have to understand that Ford, and again I'm being recorded, so I don't want Ford or I don't want to say Chevrolet because that's where we're at. Um, <laughs> Car maker. Car maker. If you look at there and they have an arbitration clause, you have to understand that the arbitrators they use are used for multiple cases. So does that arbitrator have a, a, a monetary interest in keeping that car maker happy? You see where I'm going? If it's you, consumer, versus the big car company that keeps hiring you over and over again, then, then I've never seen it straight out, but I fear that I'm at a disadvantage, okay? Because they're hiring this, this arbitrator over and over again. And if the arbitrator makes that car manufacturer mad, he's gonna lose that, he's gonna lose that business because he's getting paid by them. He's getting paid by me, he's getting paid by them. Unlike litigation in the state courts. In the state courts, your taxes pay the judge. So he's supposed to be independent. Now, the arbitrator is supposed to be independent, but I'll, I'll leave that to you if you think so. When some, one side's paying them, okay? Money's involved, so there's always something to keep in mind there. Non-compete clause. Boy, I've seen a lot of these slipped in. I see a lot of them in employment contracts. Those, are, those can be devastating. I've had people come in to me, and it's always after they've signed this thing. And they say, I gotta get out of this job, but I don't wanna get out of this industry. And I say, then you have to move out of state. You sign an agreement. You cannot do business in Clark County, right? And and all of your contacts that you've made over that time, it, it's going to be a problem. I thought they can stop buying the white horse. <clears throat> you can contract away your rights. It's a right to work state. That's true, but that ha that has to do with unions and your right to work somewhere without being a union member. That's mostly what right to work means. State means. But we have restrictive covenants in Nevada, and I gotta, I gotta finish it up, because I think I've got maybe one minute left. Two minutes left, okay. So let me, let me finish up with this. These are called restrictive covenants. They're called um, non-disclosures, uh, non-competes, um, uh, 
Oh, I got a few other times. Not peace, not disclosure, non disparagements. There we go. There's the third one. All of them have to do with either not talking bad about a company or not competing with them or or keeping certain information private. Those are all called restrictive covenants. And these restrictive covenants are disfavored in the law, but they are allowed in the law under certain circumstances. For instance, a non-compete has to be for less than two years, and it can't be more than, let's say, the, the county of Clark County. According to this, uh, the, the courts, they've said Clark County is large enough um, for a non-compete. But they can't be all over the world, and they can't be for unlimited amount of time because they're generally disfavored, but they are enforceable. But they're extremely dangerous. That's what I'm trying to bring to you. Before you sign anything with a non-compete or a non-disclosure or a confidentiality agreement, then I would really go talk to a lawyer because you need to understand that this is going to impact your life for many years to come. All right? At least two years after you stop working. Okay? And I think that's enough for contracts today. I'm going to take one question real quick. And it's easy, true, or false question. Okay. So, if you screw up and sign something with any of that stuff in it, right? <coughs> true or false? You can negotiate out of any of those things true. at any time. True. If we hire you to negotiate out, I can try to negotiate out. I can't guarantee they're going to say yes. Right. But, but that, you're right. That's a any any contract you're bound to can be contracted out of, but it has to be contracted out. Any two people who make an agreement. Can agree to rearrange the agreement. Okay, so you can always do that. Uh, try to negotiate out. So, and there's some other things I can do. I mean, if you sign them after the fact, still come to me. There's things we can do. Um, I have I have gotten people out of these because they didn't comply with the law. A lot of times these things are drafted by people who don't know the law, and so I've been able to get them out because they're just non-compliant. Okay. Again, David Salmon, David Salmon Associates. Thank you for having me today. I'm